Hello! In this video, I'll show you how to identify a two-string kite and how you can use it to eliminate candidates. Let's start by defining what a conjugate pair is. It sounds like a fancy word, but it's simply a number that appears only twice in a unit, and that's a row, a column, or a block. A two-string kite involves two conjugate pairs for the same number with one pair located in a row, and the other pair is in a column. Let's look at this hard puzzle, and here it is solved to a point where we can find a two-string kite. Now, concentrate on the number nine. Can you find two conjugate pairs of nines? One pair is in a row, and the other pair in a column. In this example, there's a conjugate pair of nines in the second row, row B, these two nines are the only possible nines in this row, and therefore they form a strong link as they are the only possible nines in row B. One will be true, and the other will be false. They cannot both be true, and they cannot both be false. Here's the second conjugate pair of nines. This time it's in the column, column four, and again, these two nines are strongly linked. They are the only nines in column four, and they cannot both be true, and they cannot both be false. One of them has to be true, and the other false. So now we have the two conjugate pairs on the nines. One pair is in a row, and the other pair is in a column. The next requirement for a two-string kite is that the two conjugate pairs meet together or are linked in the same block. We can see that these two nines meet in block two, and the two nines in block two are considered to have a weak link between them, since there are other nines in block two as well. So now we have a three-link chain, strong, weak, strong. These two pairs in the rows and columns are called the strings, and this pair here in block two forms the tail end of the kite shape, as you'll see in a moment. Okay, so how this works is, once you've identified the two strings linked in the same block, you can look at the endpoints, those are these two nines, and since one of those nines has to be true, any cell that sees both those endpoints cannot be true. In this case, cannot be a nine, so the nine can be eliminated from that cell. This cell sees both endpoints, it's in the same row as this nine, and in the same column as this nine, and therefore this nine can be eliminated. Now, if I draw a line from that cell to each of the endpoints, we can see the kite shape more easily, right? Why does this work? Well, because both nines meet in the same block, and you can only have one nine in a block, so we know that both of these two nines in block two can't be true at the same time, so these two ends can't both be false, therefore one of the endpoints has to be true. If they didn't meet in the same block, then yes, both of these endpoints could be false, but since they do meet in the same block, one of them has to be true, and so any cell that sees both cannot also be true. There will always be only one cell that sees both and is not in the same block, and that cell is at the intersection of the row and the column. One of the intersections will be in the block, so that doesn't help us, but the other intersection will be outside the block, and that will always be the elimination cell. If that cell has a nine, we can eliminate it. Yes, I know it's one number in one cell, but sometimes it can break the puzzle for you. All right, let's take a look at another example. We can see here there's a conjugate pair in the fifth row. It's also a pair of nines. The nine appears exactly twice in this row. There's also a conjugate pair in column nine. Again, the nine appears twice in this column. These two conjugate pairs of the number nine are linked or meet in block six. These nines in the fifth row form a string, and these nines in the last column also form a string. And these nines in block six form the tail of the kite. Now, in the first example I showed you, the two strings crossed over each other, so the shape of the kite's tail was more obvious. 
But in this example, the two strings don't cross each other, so you can see the shape is a bit different. And some of you might say, well, that's not a two-string kite, that's a turbofish. And yes, we can call it both. This is a turbofish, and it is also a two-string kite, since these two weakly linked nines both fall in the same block, block six. So this is both a turbofish and a two-string kite. You can also call it an X-chain with three links. But since this lesson is on the two-string kite, let's call it that since it works the same way and the strings both meet in a block. I'll do a future lesson on turbofish and discuss it some more in that lesson. But this is still a two-string kite. It just looks a little different from the first example. Now, these two nines are called the endpoints, and at least one of the endpoints must be true, so one of these endpoints must be a nine. Therefore, any cell that sees both endpoints cannot be a nine, and therefore the nine can be eliminated from that cell. This cell in the third row and third column can see both endpoints, therefore the nine in this cell can be eliminated. If I draw a line from this cell to the endpoints, you can see it's not kite-shaped like the first example, which is why some people will say this is a turbofish, but it works just like a two-string kite with the nines meeting in the same block, so let's say it can be called both. All right, how about another example? Can you find the two conjugate pairs in this example? I'll give you a hint. Concentrate on the number eight. Do you see a row that has just two eights and a column that has just two eights? And do they meet in the same block? Yes, here in the third row, row C, there are two eights. Let's draw a string between them. And here in column six, there are also just two eights, so another conjugate pair, and let's draw a string on that. Now you can see they cross over each other into block two, so here we have a weak link between these two eights. There are no other eights in block two, so we could also call it a strong link, but it's functioning here as a weak link, which is fine. You can have a strong link function as a weak link, but you can't have a weak link function as a strong link. It's not really that important in understanding what I'm doing here, but some of you might have read up on strong links and weak links, so I figured I'd point that out for your benefit. In either case, the endpoints for the strings are here, these two eights, and this cell sees both those endpoints, so the eight in this cell can be eliminated. And in this example, that leaves a naked single, the six, so that cell is solved. If I draw lines from the endpoints to that cell, you can see a clear shape of a kite. How about one last example? Take a look at this grid and concentrate on the number nine. Can you find a row with just two nines and a column with just two nines? Pause the video and see if you can find the two conjugate pairs. Here in the seventh row, row G is a pair of nines, and it's a conjugate pair since there are exactly two and only two nines in that row. And here in column three is another conjugate pair of nines. Okay, let's draw the two strings, and you can see the strings cross over each other and meet in block seven, forming a weak link. When the strings cross over each other, we get a classic kite shape, and this is the tail of the kite. We have a chain with three links, strong, weak, strong. Again, that's not really important for you to understand this. Just look at the endpoints and find the cell that sees both. Did you find it? It's this cell in block two. This cell sees both endpoints, so the nine can be eliminated from this cell. Let's draw a line from that cell to the two endpoints, and now you can see the classic two-string kite shape. This is really a useful trick to use when you get stuck in a hard-level puzzle. Look for this pattern and you'll find it pops up a lot. Well, that's it for this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you learned something.